Yeah, so Marshall in the middle, hey, this is a great program. This is something that is getting our memories out there for everybody to see, whether you're a relative, whether you're a friend or an associate, check in a Marshall in the middle and find out what your friends have done in the military because everybody is a hero and everybody needs to hear the stories that these heroes have done. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. Thank you. You're well, have a good night, man. Thank you. You too, buddy. Tell me about, about that jump where two of your you know, teammates passed away. Ah, well, you know, it was like any other jump. Um, Marshall in the middle. Man, I looked up and I was like, boy, I better straighten up. Sergeant Major's here. You know, I was like, dang, I better sit up straight. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I, uh, it's so good to see you. Wow. Oh, it's like, it's, I don't know that we've ever really spent a whole lot of time ever really talking to one another, but you were a huge mentor of mine. Huge. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And when I got to, to brag in the late eighties, I think you might've been a jump master on one of my first jumps or safety or it did something right that just like got, got a big imprint uh, uh, on my, my mind and my heart. And uh, oh, I was cool. always struck uh, your professionalism. So <clears throat> the big thing I remember you as that is the alpha battery first sergeant, right? Okay. Alpha battery yeah. third, fourth. Yeah. Yeah. The last, uh, the last few years I was there, I was the alpha battery first sergeant. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Bravo battery. Um, I was in third of the fourth from 80 to 86 and then 90 to 94. And I think on, on that second hitch is uh, I did a couple of years in Bravo and then uh, got promoted to first sergeant and went to Alpha Battery. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Which, yeah, which was cool. Uh, I, I mean, it was, it was good. You know, I, I spent so much time in Bravo Battery. It was good going somewhere else and seeing the battalion from a different perspective. So, yeah, that was nice. Isn't it interesting at, at a certain level we're so stovepiped into this battery is better than that battery. But when you really look back, look back on it, once you've got a different perspective, it's like, dude, it was so much bigger than that. It was so much cooler than that. Yeah. You know, looking back on it and talking to guys that I never really had, an, had a chance to associate with, you know, like you. I mean, we probably crossed paths several times on jumps or at the range, but there were other guys that, you know, you never really talked to because you weren't in that battery uh, that you met down the road and you think, man, that, that dude's pretty cool. Where was he? And why, never, why didn't I ever meet up with them? Because we had such great NCOs and such great officers in that battalion. It's really crazy the amount of talent that we had that you didn't realize you had until you left. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate, you know, your kind words. And, yeah, I mean, I, I knew about you. And, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm sure our paths crossed, but the – the mark was so high for professionalism and, you know, with, within the NCO rank and the officer rank that you really take things for granted for the caliber of people that we had until you left and you saw the rest of the army and you're like, oh man, I really had it good at third of the fourth. I wrote an essay not long ago about how third of the fourth ADA was gifted the best officers. We did. We got the best officers at the lieutenant level, at every level. We got given awesome officers. But what we did special was we grew our own NCOs. You had to volunteer to keep staying there. Yeah. You could go through one cycle and leave and never come back. But the folks that were there, those, those platoon sergeants that were there that were going through ORS every you know, twice a year, three times a year. Oh my gosh, those guys were pros, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I I wasn't there, or maybe when I left in 86, I missed that part of, or that little bit of history of third or the fourth, where we had guys rotating in and out of assignments to, uh, you know, ORS or, you know, NTC, uh, uh, Joint Readiness Training Center, because, 
that wasn't a thing when I was there. Uh, it, it's odd you say, you know, you had guys kept volunteering, but in my case, I was there for six years and had several assignments to go to Korea, but they all got canceled. They all got revoked because we had so, so few NCOs that were airborne qualified air defenders that I guess branch just kept on saying, nah, third of the fourth has priority. And, you know, that was cool uh, until you realize, well, man, there's a lot of army out there that I want to see. And in my case, uh, it took Bill Shaw uh, when I got married in, uh, I guess it was, well, I got married in 93, but uh, Bill Shaw is the one that when he went up to branch, he was at my wedding and he said, for your birth, for your wedding present, uh, you get one wish. What do you want? And I told him, I want to go overseas. Consider it done. And that got me in trouble. I didn't realize it at the time. <laughs> but, but Bill got me sent to Germany. Uh, but unbeknownst to me, I bypassed Wilbur Adams. And yeah, I, I made Wilbur really, really mad. Uh, from what I hear, because I bypassed the, and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't the air defense sergeant major at the time, but he was upset that I, I went around him. He thinks I went behind his back, but that's not really what happened. Bill kind of, Bill kind of threw me a bone and in, in the, you know, the spirit of everything that was going on, I said, yeah, hell yeah, man, send me overseas, send me, send me to Germany. And boom, you know, one thing led to another. And uh, it wound up being great because I, I got out of Bragg, but uh, I went to Germany in a, at a Patriot, in a Patriot battalion, which I knew nothing about. Uh, but it, it was a real cool experience because I uh, stayed in Germany for three years. And not only did I see life as a high altitude air defense guy, but I also had female troops, which that was an eye-opening experience, and I'm glad I did it because it opened up uh, another, I guess, view of the Army that I never had before that I took for granted. And uh, I, I got a chance to train with some really, really professional uh, female soldiers and female uh, officers, and it was, it was a good experience. Yeah. Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Gary, Indiana. Uh, just, yeah, I was actually born in East Chicago, Indiana. East Chicago is actually a city. Uh, we were in between Chicago and Gary, but uh, my dad was from Mexico. Uh, he was working in the steel mills in Gary at the time where he met my mom, who was from Texas. And one thing led to another. They had baby Carlos, uh, grew up in Gary, he born in East Chicago, grew up in Gary. And yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where, where I grew up on the streets of Gary. Tell, tell, I mean, okay. So on the streets of Gary, Indiana, doesn't sound so bad. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's like saying I'm from East Chicago or something. What, tell me about Gary, Indiana and growing up, you know what, this was the seventies, right? This was, yeah, I grew up in Gary, uh, in the sixties and the seventies, um, I actually enlisted in 76, but growing up in Gary, you know, in, in the 60s and early 70s, it was pretty nice. I mean, we had a little house on the suburbs that my dad bought and, you know, we, you know, I hung around with all the guys on the, on the block and, you know, we did what kids did in the 60s and the 70s. You, you played on the streets and you ran around, you rode your bike and, you know, you got into shenanigans. Uh, it, it was cool. Um, but Gary was... Uh, Gary went through kind of a change where the steel mills started having problems and they went into layoffs. And when that started happening, and it, and it wasn't just uh, in Gary, it was East Chicago, that whole area was known for steel mills because of the proximity to Lake Michigan. You know, you could ship through Lake Michigan and go over, you know, to Ohio, Canada. So when uh, the mills started really having problems, 
people started leaving Gary and that was kind of the beginning of the end. Uh, Gary was always kind of a tough town, kind of rough. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of racial issues and gangs and drugs. The proximity to Chicago probably didn't help. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it was kind of tough. Uh, I was a, a little guy. I, I probably weighed all of 140, 150 pounds, but I had the mouth of a 300 pound guy. I, I was just a, yeah, I, I, I was a real smart ass and uh, had a real mouth on me, which uh, I still kind of have, it, it's kind of been tempered, but you know, when, when you're 140, 150 pounds, but you got a, you got a big mouth, it kind of gets you in trouble. So yeah, I, I had a, I had quite a time growing up. Did you ever get in a fight as a kid? I was in two fights as a kid. Did you ever get in a fight? Yeah, I got, I got into a few fights. Uh, uh, some I lost and some I won, but uh, uh, the last one I can really remember was with a buddy of mine, Steve, who I don't, I don't even remember what we were fighting about, man, but he, he laid me out on my ass. He was fast and he knew how to fight. He knew how to box. He had an older brother that taught him that and he went to town on me. Um, and actually I fought him uh, out on the streets, but he and a buddy of his, uh, and I, I'll, I'll get up on a tangent. Uh, one of the things that, that happened to me when I was growing up in Gary, I did go to a Catholic grade school and high school. But one of the things that happened with me and Steve is uh, he and a buddy cornered me into, in a bathroom uh, in, in this Catholic high school, Bishop Noel Institute in, in Hammond, Indiana. And Bill, Steve was a, was a bully. So, I mean, even then I was getting bullied. Uh, that wasn't a thing in the seventies, but uh, it went on. And I knew I was gonna get into a fight and I already knew, man, Steve's gonna whoop my ass. But I got the first punch in and I blacked his eye and that was enough. At that point, I got that first punch in and I covered up and he went to town on me. <laughs> so we walked away from there. We, we got out of that bathroom and I came out okay. I mean, not marked up or anything, but Steve had a black eye for a few weeks. So the story was, the narrative was, well, yeah, I kicked Carlos's butt. Yeah, but you got a black eye, so. <laughs> oh, that's great, right? Isn't it, isn't it interesting how things like that uh, develop friendships sometimes over, uh, with you and, you and Steve maybe over some silliness? I don't know how all that turned out. Well, I mean, we grew up as friends. I mean, we, you know, we, we grew up playing around. We played, you know, baseball, football, hockey. Uh, I, you know, kids, who knows what happened that uh, we decided we were going to throw down. But, I mean, it is what it is. I haven't seen the guys since I graduated high school back in 76. So, don't know what happened to them. But, you know, what are you going to do? Isn't it interesting how you have a group of people that are so tight, like in basic training and AIT for a short time, you're so tight and then the funnel lets out and you, you know, like, I wonder where that person went. You know, I have no idea. I have no idea. Were you good as a school guy? Did you, did you do good in school? Were you smart? You, I know you're smart. You're, you're freaking brilliant. Well, I, I have, I have a, a kind of spurts of brilliance. Uh, I was a lazy student, uh, you know, and, and, in retrospect, yeah. Uh, in retrospect, you know, my dad was from Mexico. My mom was from Southern Texas. Neither of them went to college. So they didn't really push that on us when we were growing up. So I, I never had that push to go to college. I knew that was a thing. Uh, but you know, growing up, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, which kind of leads up to why I joined the Army. Uh, I, I grew up in Gary, and the thing that the guys did uh, in my neighborhood in that area was you graduated college and you went to the mills. Well, the mills started, you know, they started ha having issues and they started layoffs, and it, was, it wasn't as easy to get in as it used to be. And, you know, my dad, I remember him, you know, working at the mills and he, he worked pretty hard. I mean, he retired from the mills and I thought, man, there's got to be more than that. So I thought about going to college, but you know, in high school, I, I can't remember ever really studying a lot. I, I did okay. I, I had good grades and 
I guess in a Catholic high school, if, if your average uh, compared to public school, I was probably an A student. So I think having that, you know, that education, uh, and I, I think, you know, looking back, I, I am a pretty smart guy. If I would have applied myself, uh, I think I could have gotten into college and gone a different route. But, you know, things happen for a reason. And it's nothing really that I've looked back on and, you know, lost a lot of sleep over. It is what it is. But um, I, I think just having a good head on my shoulders and, and being independent kind of led me to that path that I had to join the army, which in and of itself is kind of weird because I never really thought about joining the army. Uh, I was out one weekend at a drag strip uh, outside of Gary in Maryville, Indiana, the US 30 drag strip. And I was out there just with some friends. We were watching you know, the funny cars and the drag racing and a recruiter was out there. And uh, he gave me a card and started talking to me. And one thing led to another. And I went out to the recruiting office and Gary took the test. And, and I'm doing all of this thinking, eh, I'll just see what happens. I took the ASVAB and he called me up and he said, hey man, you got really high scores. Why don't you come on in and let's see what we can do for you. Now, well, you got to understand that while all this was going on, I hadn't spoken at all to my parents about joining the army. Yeah, uh, this, I've always had this, like I said, this independent streak, but um, I talked to, I talked to this, uh, this recruiter and he talked up, you know, the army and, and, you know, the leadership and, and the big thing was the GI bill. So my plan was, okay, I'll join the army for three years. I'll get the GI bill. Then I'll go to school. So one thing led to another, uh, I, I enlisted and rose my arm, came home and told my parents and they freaked out, uh, because I was the first guy in my family to join the military, but I hadn't talked to them about it either. So it was kind of a, a, a rough patch there, but I think my dad was okay with it because uh, I think he thought that it would be good to teach me responsibility and give me some time away from home in a job where uh, I was gonna I was gonna learn something. So that's what that's what got me. Uh, uh, that's what got me in the army. Tell me about about brothers and sisters. Uh, I've got one brother, uh, Cosme, who is uh, still in the area. Uh, he's in Griffith, Indiana. I've got two sisters. Uh, Laura and Linda. Uh, I'm the I'm the oldest. Uh, Laura is married. She is in Chesterton, Indiana, and my sister Linda, the youngest, uh, she is moving from Mississippi to Kentucky right now. Um, yeah, so, so they're they're doing their own thing. Everybody's doing great. What 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 did your 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 uh, brothers and sisters think about when you joined the army? How'd they take it? They you know. To be honest, we really didn't talk about um, what my life in the army was like or, or what it was like on the family. Um, they thought they, well, I told them that I did it just to get out of Gary and to get the GI Bill. Uh, they saw it as this was a chance for me just to get out of the house. So, so there were some, there were, there were some mixed feelings there. Um, but I think when they saw that I was going to turn it into a career and they saw things happening with me, I, they, they were cool with it. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I kid them because I don't think any of them really understood what I was doing. I mean, they knew that I was a paratrooper. They knew that I was a drill sergeant. They knew I was out in Desert Storm. But when you ask them, well, what did he do? Oh, I, I, I don't know. They just know, oh, he was in the army. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's a lot of why we're doing this right now. That's why these interviews are coming out so that 
so that, you know, look, your grandkids can point to granddad and say, look at this badass granddad I got, right? Look at this guy, you know? You know, and so, you know, dude, you're one of my heroes weightlifting, man. Tell me about lifting weights. Well, yeah. Um, you know, guys ask me a lot about that. And, well, it, the, the story really starts in basic training, uh, to be honest. So I enlisted in 76, uh, and I took my first plane ride from Chicago to El Paso, Texas, and did my basic training at Fort Bliss in October of 76. Uh, my first time out of the, out of the state, really. Now, I, I was in Texas uh, visiting, but uh, I was on my own. You know, no family, no friends. It was really a shocking experience to me. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you remember your first night in basic training when you're sleeping in the barracks and all the guys are in there on their bunk beds and, you know, everybody's talking trash. And, you know, we, we had the stereotypical, you know, guy out there strutting around, who's going to whoop my ass? I'm the baddest guy in here. And I was like, oh, holy shit. This, I thought this only happened in the movies. But uh, basic training was really an eye-opening experience for me because I, I met a lot of guys that, you know, I, I wouldn't have met otherwise from all over the country, but I was a small wiry guy and uh, I basically failed every PT test I took uh, from my first one to, I want to say it was my last one. Uh, the only one that I ever really passed was, uh, and I don't know what we did basic training, but at Fort Bliss, we spent two weeks out in the desert at McGregor Range qualifying. Okay, so uh, when the PT test for me was the run, dodge, and jump, the one mile run, the horizontal ladder, um, and, and there was some other stuff, but I was fine with everything except that damn horizontal ladder. I just could not do the freaking ladder to save my life. And I kept failing that on my PT test until one time at McGregor range of all places, I managed to stay up on that horizontal ladder and passed. So, I mean, I was ecstatic because up until that point, I thought, shit, I'm going to fail basic training and I'm going to get sent back home. I was fine in everything else. I mean, I got all the common tasks done and I qualified with my weapon and passed everything else. It even made me a squad leader. But, uh, you know, I, I, I managed to pass that one PT test. And I think that because of that, they let me graduate basic training and, and got out of there. So after basic training, I, I kind of decided that's it. I am never going to fail another PT test. And between AIT to today, uh, I've always had some aspect of physical training that I've done, uh, whether you know, I, was, I was doing it for the military or I was doing it for myself. When, when I got out, when I retired in 2000, I still kept working out. You know, I'd go out to the gym. I, started, I, I got hired by the Timken Company in Ohio Still went out to the gym and trained, uh, moved down here to North Carolina, uh, did martial arts. I did Krav Maga for about three or four years, got a blue belt there, uh, started doing CrossFit for about three years. And then that translated to doing weightlifting. So it's, uh, it's just something I always did. And uh, I, I don't, I don't see it as a big deal with me because it's something I've always done, but I have noticed that a lot of our peers, uh, there's been a tendency that, you know, when guys get out of the army, well, I don't have to do PT anymore. Uh, I'm good. I don't, I don't, I don't have to run another mile as long as I live. And, you know, I, I found out and I've been telling the young guys at the gym, y'all got to keep moving. Don't stop because once you stop, it's hard to get going again. You get stiff, you get old. Before you know it, you're sitting on a sofa, you're fat and you're out of shape and you got bad health. So um, I think that's just 
you know, good fortune for me. And, you know, knock on wood, I, I didn't have any injuries uh, in the 10 years that I was jumping out of airplanes or the other 14 years that I was in the Army that kept me from being able to move and do things to take care of myself. Amen. Amen. I, I'm in the same kind of boat. I'm not disabled. I'm not hurt. I can go run. I can do anything I want to do. Uh, just like I was 21 years old, you know, being a being a sergeant in the 82nd Airborne Division. I yeah, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell me, tell me about you know, you're in basic training. You're scrawny. You're having trouble getting by. You're 70s, dude. That's you know, that's bicentennial. You know, Jimmy Carter's the president back then. Come on, yeah. man. That's that's old school stuff right there, man. Did y'all have? Did y'all have? Did y'all still have? Uh, y'all have real socks back then or what oh man uh basic training was wild i mean uh the things you know we had some rough and tumble drill sergeants back then and and when i say they were old school i mean they are stereotypical old school where they would take a guy back behind the barracks and they would whoop his ass if if he started mouthing off and stuff uh, i remember very vividly we were on a run in the desert at mcgregor range and we were, they were killing us. I, I mean, it was probably 70 or 80 degrees outside, but because, you know, this is between October and, and, and November when we were doing basic training. I mean, you've been out in the record range in the morning, it's freezing cold. And, and by noon, it's could be 90 degrees, but we're running back to our, back to our tents because we slept in pup tents and uh, we had field jackets on and helmet and, and, you know, your LBE on and we're dying because it's so hot. And this kid smarted off and this drill sergeant, and I can't remember who it was, but this drill sergeant yanked him out of the formation and started shaking him, picked him up off the ground and started shaking him and said, you blah, blah, blah. I could kill you, bury you out here in the desert and no one's ever going to find you. And I'm looking at this and I'm holy crap, what the hell have I gotten myself into? They're going to bury me out here in the desert. So, you know, that was one of those defining moments where, you know, you said, that's it. I am never going to fall out of another run. Even if I just have to just shuffle along in the back, I'm never going to mouth off. I'm just going to, you know, keep my eyes forward and, and stay out of trouble. Amen. Uh, Amen. Were you good with your weapon? Were you a good shot? I was okay in, uh, you know, basic training was the first time I ever fired a weapon. Um, so I, I was able to qualify uh, and I, I like shooting, but uh, the only reason I didn't fire an expert, we had this Lieutenant that, that was our platoon leader that he gave me some bad information for zeroing my weapon. And I got out to the qualification range and I kept missing you know, some targets and the, the drill sergeant was getting on me. And I said something about the Lieutenant told me to do something with my zero and that's not right. And that got into this whole comical, are you saying the Lieutenant gave you some bad information private? What do you know about it? And it turned into that. And I was like, all right, shut this down. You better, you better stop before they bury you out here. So, you know, I, I, I was just happy to qualify. Uh, but, from that point on, you know, once I got to Fort Hood and then a Fort Bragg, when I got to Bragg, man, it was heaven because we qualified twice a year. Uh, if you wanted ammo, you could shoot as much as you want to, basically. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've stayed. I, I like shooting. Uh, yeah, I mean, even now I built myself a, a, a precision rifle and, and I'm, I'm going out to a range about an hour away from here. And I'm hitting targets, you know, anywhere from 600 to 900 meters. So I'm still, I'm still doing my thing. What caliber are you shooting? Uh, 6.5 Creedmoor. Oh, that's sweet. That's yeah. Sweet. Cool, cool. Well, that's 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 awesome, right there. Do you do you build you a a, a bolt action or a semi? Uh, no, it's a bolt action. I started with uh with the Remington 700, and I basically the only thing that I have on it on my rifle now that's still original is the bolt. 
uh, everything else I replaced. I, I got a, an aluminum chassis. I got a precision barrel. I replaced the trigger and got a, a, a two-stage trigger. Um, I, I got a, a nice little muzzle brake on there. I'm, I'm toying around with getting a, a suppressor, but I don't know if I want to hassle with that. But I, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I like it. It's, it's nice. You know, going out to the range, I find it it's relaxing because you're there, it's quiet, and you got to concentrate on what you're doing, and you kind of get into a zone where you know you, you're th you got one thing on your mind, you know, trying to relax to pull the trigger, and it's not like an AR where you're just out there, pop, 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 you know, popping off rounds with with a, with a precision rifle. You're really concentrating, so. It's that's kind of like my Zen thing. So, okay. So I've heard it both ways. Do you like wind or no wind? If you're going to shoot, do you want a little bit of wind to play with and think about, or do you want it to be still? Well, I mean, I'd like it to be still, but uh, I like wind because I need to learn how to compensate for the wind. So, I mean, I, I, not, not some crazy, you know, 10 miles an hour, 20 mile an hour wind that, is too hard to mess around with, but you know, I I've gone out with friends of mine that uh, have started precision shooting, and and they're actually the ones that got me into it. Uh, but they never realized my experience with a weapon and how much I used to shoot. So we've gone out to the range, and I they think that I'm just some rookie that. Oh, he, yeah, he got this Remington 700 he put together. Yeah, we're, we're going to put Carlos out here on the line and see what he does. Well, I started banging targets at like 600 and 800 meters right off the bat. And I said, dude, I was in the Army for 24 freaking years. I was a paratrooper for 10. I did a lot of shooting. So, and, and I said, I was a drill sergeant, so I taught basic rifle marksmanship. I know how to shoot. Uh, and... Uh, it's, it's, uh, so the wind thing is, is kind of something that I know how to do it. I just don't do it very well yet. Tell me about being a drill instructor. Did you like putting the round brown on? You were a drill instructor in the eighties, right? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was a drill sergeant from, um, uh, uh, in, from 86, uh, to basically 90 when I went back to Fort Bragg. Uh, drill sergeant, uh, drill sergeant duty for me was, uh, in lieu of going overseas. I, I think that was a bone that, uh, uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was Sergeant, Sergeant Major Adams or maybe, uh, Miranda, who was the battalion Sergeant Major, but couldn't get overseas. But there were a lot of guys who were rotating back and forth for drill sergeant duty. And I dropped my packet, uh, had to go see the division command sergeant major, and he kind of did an interview, which I think sped the process along. But yeah, drill sergeant, you know, drill sergeant duty was pretty cool. I, I liked it. Um, I got to see kids coming in the military that were like me, you know, back in the 70s. Uh, and I, that kind of kept things in perspective because I wasn't a, a basic training superstar when I went through. So I kept that in the back of my mind, like, you got to give these guys a break there. As long as they're trying, uh, you know, I, I didn't do the crazy drill sergeant thing a lot. I, I did it a few times, but with me, it was more, it was more, uh, an act than anything because, I'd like to think that I could turn it on and turn it up. I could play the drill sergeant, the mean drill sergeant when I had to, but I, I didn't really uh, have a power trip about it and get myself in trouble. Yeah, yeah. There, we all know a drill sergeant or two that, that got themselves in a mess on a power trip. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Good, good on you. Uh, yeah. So you were a you were a drill when I was coming in. You know, I came in in '87. I was the Alpha Four One Moten Gator there. At, uh, <laughs> At bliss you know okay yeah yeah, yeah we probably I, I i don't know that i was in uh i had anybody now but i was in charlie four which uh actually was the same battalion that i was a private in uh you know 20 years earlier so yeah it was it was a good experience uh 
I, you know, and that's when I really started seeing the difference in guys from different parts of the army. The, the person that really uh, threw me a life raft, so to speak, was uh, Sean Lear. Because Sean Lear was a senior drill sergeant to the first battalion or the first company that I went to as a drill sergeant. And uh, I didn't know Sean very well. I mean, Sean was in Charlie Battery. He was in Delta Battery. And then he was in Charlie Battery. Uh, I knew of him, but didn't know him really well. But what Sean did when, when I was processing for Bliss as drill sergeant, Sean called up to the battalion S1 and basically he told me the story. He said, I called up to the S1 and just said, uh, drill sergeant Martinez is coming to Charlie four. And the PAC NCO said, okay. So he got me assigned to his company and he was a senior drill sergeant. And he told me after, you know, he told me later, he goes, I, I don't, I didn't think anybody would assign you to my company. I just called up there on a whim, but lo and behold, Sean, you know, he was kind of a gregarious, uh, you know, guy that, you know, he would just, he was crazy. Uh, and one thing led to another and yeah, I got, I got in his company and Sean kind of mentored me into what life was like, uh, what it was going to be like as a drill sergeant at Fort Bliss, which was, uh, yeah, in some cases it was cool. And in some cases it was a rude awakening, but yeah, it was, it was good. Oh, uh, those years, man, the brass tap, that was back yeah. when that drinking age was 18. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, crazy that, times. That, that whole, uh, yeah, that whole that whole area uh, down there, man. Um, it well, you know, and just like any place else uh, in basic training, we were really under strength. Uh, instead of having drill sergeant or three drill sergeants in the platoon, we we had two. It was just uh, usually me and another guy, and you know, we were playing the morning, you know, the early drill sergeant and the late drill sergeant, and it, long days, long days, and uh, not a lot of break time between cycles, and it, it was pretty, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, when I thought about everything, it was pretty, a pretty stressful period, um, yeah. a lot of hours and very little sleep. My drill sergeants were Jackson, Sansone, and Renteria. Well, you know, and I knew all of those guys, uh, Sansone was actually in Bravo Battery for a long time. I don't know if you heard what happened to him. I heard. Uh, I heard he's passed away. No, he didn't pass away. There, there was, there was a, a, a lot of a, a, a lot of rumors flying around. He went AWOL at Bliss. Really? Yeah. He now Sansone and I were in Bravo Battery a long time, uh, just like Greg Gallen. I knew those guys back when we were all buck sergeants back in the 80s. But uh, Sansone was a drill sergeant. Uh, I don't remember if he was in my company, but we kept in pretty close tabs of each other. Um, Sansone had this uncanny knack of being a great marksman to the point where he qualified for the Fort Bliss marksmanship team. And he was going to get pulled off a of drill sergeant duty to go shoot on a marksmanship team, which I told him, man, that's awesome. You know, ride that because it's going to be great. But Sansone got himself in trouble with the ladies and started getting himself in trouble, like not showing up for formations. And one thing led to another. He went AWOL. And everybody thought, you know, after he was gone and he eventually was classified a deserter. I mean, he never came back. We never, no one ever figured out what happened to him. But I don't know if you know uh, Wallace Tisdale. Well, Sansone married, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Tisdale married Sansone's sister. So there was a connection there. And uh, a long time after all of this started happening, uh, I got a hold of Tisdale 
because rumors were flying around that, yeah, Sansone killed himself or he died. And I got a hold of Wally, who lives in Fayetteville, and I said, hey, man, what happened to Sansone? And he said, oh, that crazy, that crazy bastard. He's out west. He's in Arizona or some crazy place. He's painting houses. He's fine, at least uh, probably 10, as of 10 years ago. But he, he, he was fine. You know, he just kind of fell off the face of the earth. But, you know, that's a guy that, you know, he had, he had the world out in front of him. And for whatever reason, he just, you know, blew it. That, that's all I can. That's all I can figure. Uh, so it's interesting. Is uh, so it's cool the the layers of the story that that you know come out as we talk over the years. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. Tell me, tell me about you becoming a sergeant. You know, were you a? Did you make that break easily? Were you a good? Were you a good young sergeant? Um, I, I think initially. Uh, I was a good sergeant because I wanted the responsibility, but I was really, really eager. I mean, I wanted to be a sergeant so bad. Uh, so, you know, I, I told you initially, I joined the army just to do three years. And that was my plan, you know, three years, get out, go to school. But I got in the army and I loved it. I, I loved, the, the regimentation, I loved, you know, having, having a set schedule and I loved the structure. Uh, I loved, you know, being a soldier. So I decided, well, I'm going to stay in. I'm going to do three more years. But I got my first assignment was at Fort Hood. And man, I hated Fort Hood. And I was in the first cab division. Uh, chasing tanks in a Vulcan SP. And it was terrible. I mean, Fort Hood was, I, I, don't, I don't know what it's like now, but I mean, you probably remember the news of all the, all the deaths that they've had out there. Uh, Fort Hood was not some place that I was very happy with. So I, I tell the story, I hated Fort Hood so bad, I volunteered to jump out of a perfectly good airplane to get out of there. So I volunteered for jump status, uh, and I got sent to Fort uh, to Bragg in, in 80. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you get to Bragg, and it was like somebody turned the light on in a dark room. It's like, oh, my God, look at this place. The troops are great. The NCOs are awesome. I'm jumping out of airplanes, and, this, and they're, paying me, they're paying me to do this. Uh, and being an NCO in third of the fourth was the epitome of being an NCO to me. And uh, at that point, you know, when, when I first got to third of the fourth, it was in the old division area. Um, I walked into the barracks of Buck Sergeant because I, I made Sergeant when I was at Fort Hood. I walked into the barracks of my platoon uh, coming out of the replacement station and a young corporal opened the door, snapped to attention and yelled at ease in the barracks. And I looked behind me to see who was coming in and <laughs> because no one had ever done that, but it was for me. And I thought, holy shit, this is awesome. And, you know, there I was, uh, I, I didn't really realize the responsibility of a sergeant until I got to Fort Bragg. And uh, that's where, you know, things really started to gel. And at that point, you know, that three years turned into 24. And the 10 years I spent at, at Bragg and third of the fourth, uh, that was, you know, the best time of my military career and, you know, the, the formative years of my life uh, as a man. Amen. Amen. The, there was something about being willing to jump out of an airplane with a group of people, no matter what happened in the middle of the night, wherever we went, we, we, there was a bond that was formed somehow in that, yeah. right? It's crazy, crazy. Yeah. About that. Yeah. It's, 
it's, it's really, you know, I've tried to explain that to people. Um, and it's, it's really not something you can really explain unless you've done something like that. I mean, unless you were a first responder or you've been in the military, you know, you, I mean, my family knew that, that I jumped out of airplanes for a long time, but uh, they, they don't understand, you know, when you're crammed together in a C-130 at night and you're getting, you know, tossed around by some crazy, crazy National Guard pilot uh, and, <laughs> and you're on the verge of, of puking your guts up and, you know, they open up that door uh, and there seems to have, there seems to be a calm that just, you know, permeates through that plane and you're like, okay, things are going to be okay now. And when, when you consider that life is going to be good because you're going to jump out of this airplane, it's like, holy crap, what, what are you talking about? But I mean, that's, that's what life was for us that, you know, life was jumping out of that airplane and, and being a paratrooper. It's so funny you say that, right? It is amazing. And I was trying to describe this the other day. When they open the door, the calm that went through the airplane, it's like, yes, we're going to get out of this thing. We're going to get out of this thing alive. Because many times it seemed like flying, we were going to die. <laughs> it wasn't the jump that we were worried about. Yeah, dude, I, I got to tell you, uh, you know, when... When I got back uh, for my second hitch uh, with the 82nd after uh, in, in 89, um, I got really crazy airsick. Uh, I don't know what happened with me, but you know, before, when, uh, during my first tour, when I was a safety and I was riding back, I, I had a bad habit of, of getting airsick, but it seemed like the second time I went back, I, I, it got worse to the point where uh, I remember one time I was primary jump master and I was doing a door check and I had to come out of the door to blow chunks. And, you know, I, I got everything back together. I threw the bag out the door. I went back out, did my door check and everything was fine. But I went on sick call the next day and I remember going to the doctor and I said, look, you got you to gotta give me something because I can't get sick like that as a jump master and I'm gonna to have to terminate. So they gave me scopalamine patches to, to put behind my ear. And, you know, the guys, of course, you know, rode me hard on that. They, they <laughs> the pussy patch, they called it. But, you know, it was, it was, that's the only way that I really could function as, as a jump master uh, anymore. Uh, but, um, you know, I thought about what you talked about and that calm in the plane. And I think what happens is as paratroopers, we got so indoctrinated and we train so hard for things like actions in the aircraft that when that door opened up, everybody flipped a switch, whether they knew it or not. And before that, you'd be in the plane, you know, guys would have their helmet off and you're napping, you're bullshitting with the guy across from you and you're cutting up. Dude, that door opens up, that flip, that switch gets flipped and guys get serious because, all right, here we go. It's going to happen. Things, shit's going to happen now. And, you know, the, I, I never really had a lot of jumps with other units, thankfully because uh, I, I just remembered that all of my jumps with third of the fourth were good jumps. Uh, I won't say I never had any issues, but they were so few and far between. They were, they were good experiences. Oh yeah. Remember before you go out the door, you look at the guy in front of you and behind you and say, Hey man, have a good jump, have a good jump. You know, it's yeah. like, it, it really was. It's a total camaraderie of being willing to do whatever your country asked you to do. We were willing to go do it. You know, and it didn't matter. It was just whatever. It yeah. Was. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is uh, I, I was going over your answers or your questions. And 
you know, I, I, st- I thought about, well, man, what am I going to tell Will? Because, you know, I don't, I don't want to get up there like a stammering idiot. But, um, you know, the thing, the things that we did, uh, you know, and it, it all goes back to the training. You know, think about what we did. We, we got on, a, on an Air Force airplane with 70 guys. We strapped on about 70 to 100 pounds of gear. And we flew for about 40 minutes, bouncing around. And we're going to jump out at night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you're you're going to jump out at night at about 800 feet. And with all the training, that was our normal. But, you know, when you think about it, that was some crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. We did did some crazy stuff. Uh, And then you throw in a mass tack. You throw in high winds. You throw in stinger missile jump pack. Uh, going out on an exercise where now your your air flight you're, you're rigging you know on the way to Fort Bliss or McGregor Range, uh, we did some really really incredible stuff that to us was yeah yeah we're gonna inflate rig going into Fort Bliss yeah we're gonna jump at night no moon in the desert yeah no big deal yeah it is crazy that's that's part of is is why when maggot got sick i said i've got to start telling these stories and talking to people because it, look we were before digital photos we were before you know everything was recorded now every time they jump they're they're videoing it you know yeah. look <laughs> dude we jumped there was no video of the stuff we did you know yeah. <laughs> come on <laughs> yeah and 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 uh, i know i know some guys back in like the early days uh will merriman uh who who was a great soldier and a great jump master he he used to do this thing where he would rig up on the left door or hook up on the left door and he'd run across and jump out of the right door <laughs> that was a safety on a plane one time I thought, who does that why what, what's but you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that guys did. And, you know, and, you know, Will probably had crap, a hundred jumps, you know, when he was doing that. So he was very well experienced, but God, if you did, if you tried doing that now, who knows what would happen? Oh yeah. It's, it's just interesting. The time that we grew up in, you know, it was, you know, that was back when, you know, we didn't even need bicycle helmets as kids, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What? So, so tell me, tell me about becoming a first sergeant. Um, well, so first sergeant for me was kind of like uh, me chasing the chevrons for, for a sergeant. Uh, at, at the time, I, I had spent a lot of time in Bravo Battery uh, and it, it seemed for a while there that we were always getting a new first sergeant for some reason or another. Uh, and I, I would fill in, I'd, I'd be the acting first sergeant. And, you know, when, when you're a platoon sergeant or even a squad leader, you know, you look at the first sergeant and you're like, oh, first sergeant, you know. Uh, and you, you think of this mystical title and duty uh, and you're like, man, one day I want to be a first sergeant because it's, there's so much power, you know, and in hindsight, having been a battalion sergeant major, the first sergeant really is where it's at. That position and that duty really is the most powerful position because you have so much influence over what happens in that unit, uh, more so than the sergeant major. Uh, first sergeant, first sergeants really don't understand until they move out of that position how much power they had. But anyway, uh, I, I'd been acting first sergeant on and off, and at third or the fourth, especially, you know, you, you, I made those meetings with all the other first sergeants, and you know, coordinated things with Sergeant Major Adams and Sergeant Major Miranda, and you know, coordinated jumps and this and that. So when uh, when the time came, and you know, I got that you know, got that promotion. Um, 
that that was really a high point for me because uh, you know just like the NCOs, a high caliber of NCOs that we had in the battalion, man, the first sergeants we had are legendary. So I was, you know, to say that yeah, I was a first sergeant and, and third of the fourth air defense, man, uh, that was the epitome for me. So yeah, so tell me about some of those folks that that you know were you were peers with or leaders or soldiers. Tell me some of the names you remember from those times. Oh, um, well, man, uh, Ross Bennett. Uh, Ross Bennett was was a, a squad leader with me in Bravo when I first I first got there. Greg Allen, uh, Sansone, we were all squad leaders. Uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Major Miranda was a platoon sergeant. He was in Delta Battery for a while. And I remember it was, you know, late 80. Um, I had, I, I went home because my mom passed away and I came back uh, to Old Division and they had just made Miranda my platoon sergeant. And he came to, you know, come, come to check me out after I came back off of leave. And Miranda was a great, you know, he was a great platoon sergeant. He was, you know, one of the most professional guys I, I ever knew. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there was him and, and I mean, um, oh, some other guys. I'm, I'm trying to remember some of the names, um, but, you know, there, there are just so many that, you um, you, you just take it for granted, you know, the talent that you had out there that, uh, well, I mean, even on Facebook, I mean, you've, you've gone, we've both been through all the shenanigans with, uh, you know, that we got into with Facebook between, uh, you know, the election and, and all the guys that we would bicker back and forth, Al Rucker, uh, you know, through that all, through all of that commotion, uh, everybody still stayed professional and, um, you know, we, we kind of kept it from getting personal, but yeah, it's, um, um, Delaney, uh, Cheryl Riddick, uh, all those guys. Yeah. Great guys. Awesome guys. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't really, you know, when you look around the crew that was with us back in those days, you know, it's just really amazing. Uh, the awesomeness of the folks that that were around and and I'm you know I've been able to to talk to and and re reconnect with so many folks I just feel so blessed that God like you would be willing to talk to me and tell these old stories you know I see the statues behind you tell me something about those statues behind you there's there's one up top well and then, and then there's another one on the on the thing tell me about those well, the, the one to, to my, it'll, I guess it's going to be on uh, the little guy on, yeah, on, over there. on the case. That was, uh, that's a little, a little drill sergeant that uh, one of my platoons gave me uh, for a grad, after graduation. Oh, and, that's awesome. Yeah, the, the guy on top, uh, that's just a rigged up uh, jumper. Uh, I got that as a memento. Uh, I don't know if I got it, got that at the museum or the PX, uh, on brag, but yeah, just some, you know, little, little tokens that, that I picked up over the years that, uh, just, you know, memories. I love it. I love it. Isn't it neat? The memorabilia and the coins and the different things that the ribbons, you know, Napoleon said he could conquer the world. He gave him those little pieces of ribbon, you know, yeah. it's really wild how they entice us with all that stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, but. You know, I've told I've told guys that are still in the army uh, to not get too wrapped up about ribbons and awards uh, because it, it was you know, and I I'll be honest, uh, I had a real axe to grind over what I think was. Um, being not having an opportunity over some decorations that I thought myself and some other guys were worthy of uh, back in the day because of what I call politics at the time. And, and one of those was coming out of Desert Storm uh, where, you know, we got uh, MSMs, uh, Meritorious Service Medals, instead of Bronze Stars, which they were throwing, just throwing up in the air at Fort Bliss if you were a Patriot crewman and, and 
you know, you had a lieutenant that pushed a button to launch a missile that, that shot a scud, man, they, they were throwing out bronze medals. Uh, but, you know, here we were in, in, uh, in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia holding down positions, uh, you know, we come back with MSN. So that was one thing, but, uh, it, you know, so, so I told guys that would contact me, I said, look, when you get out of the army, and you get yourself another job, no one's gonna care. Civilians don't care about that stuff. Uh, you, you can't put on your resume, uh, I got a meritorious service medal with, with a three, joint, uh, three Oak Leaf cluster because they don't know what that is. Uh, they barely know the difference between an NCO and an officer. Uh, so it doesn't matter if, if you got out and, and you got an MSM or anything else. Um, as long as you're healthy and, and hopefully you come out without uh, any ill effects, just be happy with that. Amen. So, yeah, you know, all those medals and stuff, I mean, they, uh, they still represent a lot, but it's something I've learned to let go of. I saw a picture of you earlier with like gold medals, like three or four gold medals from weightlifting. I was like, Dude, that is cool, man. Well, that's cool. But, but well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm in what's considered a master class for weightlifting. And it, it seems that you're considered a master when you turn 35, which is crazy to me because 35, you're still so young. But in weightlifting, I mean, you really, guys really hit their peaks when they're in their mid to late 20s. So if you're a 30-year-old weightlifter, you're, you're an anomaly because you're still lifting weights and you're old. So you got my old ass out there in my 60s uh, doing this stuff. There aren't a lot of 60-year-olds in North Carolina that do a lot of weightlifting. So when I go out to a meet, and they break it up into age groups. Typically, I'm the only uh, 60 to 65 year old out there throwing weights around. So those medals around my neck in a lot of cases are participation awards because I'm there and I was the only one there. But, but I, I am there. So um, I, I, you got to go, you got to put in the work, you got to get on that stage, you got to make some good lifts. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, so, not, it, it's, it's nothing that, that I'm, I'm really uh, throwing up in anybody's face, but it's nice. Yeah, right. I look, so I, one of the things that I love more than anything is supporting those folks that I see around me that are doing things out of the ordinary or that that's going above and beyond. I've got friends that are doing, you know, um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I got folks that are trying to start their companies. I got folks that wants to be a DJ. I got folks that want to be photographers and, 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 you know, and so I just become a fan, right? I become a cheerleader and be excited when I see you in a picture of you lifting weights. I'm like, dude, I got to get back in. I'm going to, I'm going to do some squats. You know, I, I like that. Well, you know, I, I hope, you know, I, I, I've never really been one to, uh, to throw stuff in, in people's face, to put myself on a pedestal. I, I'm really not about that, but I'm hoping that I can show some of our peers that, you're not old and you're not too old to get under a bar and do some squats. Uh, and I, I know some guys have some injuries and they've got some, some issues health wise that may pro may, may keep them from getting out to the gym, maybe to the level that you or I are at, but go out and do something. Uh, I think, you know, our bodies were meant to move. Our bodies were meant to move under strain so the longer you can do that, it's just a quality of life issue. And, and I'm doing this, I, I used to joke about it, but it's kind of getting serious now because I'm, I'm in my 60s. Uh, I want to be a burden on the taxpayers. Uh, I want to live a long life and keep drawing that retirement check. So, Amen. Yeah. Amen. 
you're strong, buddy. I love it. I love it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. So tell me about, tell me about, you know, getting promoted to that next level. You know, you're going from, from first sergeant to, you know, the next level of command sergeant major and, and how all that goes. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a pretty crazy, uh, a crazy time for me. Uh, I was in Germany and I was the headquarters, headquarters battery first sergeant of a Patriot company, uh, five, seven, I was the HHB five, seven first sergeant. And now there's a story there. Um, when I got ready to, to, to go to Germany, uh, I got in contact with the battalion sergeant major from five, seven. And, uh, I said, Sergeant major, Carlos Martinez, I'm, I'm coming over as a first sergeant. I said, Sergeant Major, I'll be honest with you. I've been a short range guy my whole career. Don't know anything about Patriot. Where do you think you want me? And he said, well, first sergeant, I think I'm going to put you in a firing battery so you can learn what happens in a Patriot battalion. And I said, Sergeant Major, that's great. Sounds good. I'll see you in a few weeks. Fast forward land in Germany, go to the battalion headquarters. And he said, first sergeant, uh, I'm going to put you in HHB. You're going to be my HHB first sergeant. And I thought, okay, uh, I didn't know any better, but I found out that of uh, the other first sergeants that we had, and there were, I think, five or six other comp firing companies that we had or firing batteries that we had, none of them wanted to be the HHB first sergeant. So I got that position because no one else wanted it and it was the only position left. So I walked in um, not only knowing nothing about Patriot, but not knowing how that headquarters battery got structured because uh, I had a survey unit, which I didn't know what a, sur what a survey was. I had cooks, I had medics, I had a, a, a red eye or a, I'm sorry, a stinger platoon attached to me. Um, and on, on top of all that, I had all the things that a Patriot HHB has that I knew nothing about. So, um, and, uh, and on top of all of that, we were getting ready to go to a deployment in Saudi Arabia in two months. So wild times, but um, I was the first sergeant uh, of 5-7, of the HHB, and we were at um, a St. Barbara's Ball. And our uh, battalion S3, a guy by the name of uh, uh, Delgado, Raymond Delgado, happened to, to come in, and he, he saw me and my wife uh, with some other folks who were there, and he said, oh, hey, Sergeant Major, how you doing? And I looked up at him, I said, Sir, uh, he had one too many shots of tequila. He goes, oh, no. Uh, I just saw the promotion list. Uh, you've been recommended for, or you came up on the promotion list for Sergeant Major. And, man, I was immediately happy. And, but he also said, oh, and you, you got recommended for Command Sergeant Major on the same list. And, man, I was floored. Um, I, I mean, I was hoping one day I'd get promoted to Sergeant Major uh, and eventually Command Sergeant Major, but I hit both on the same list. And through and, and it happened because, and I think, Will, you, you can agree. Uh, I think you'd agree with me. You know, guys who get promoted, get promoted because they've done all the hard, all the hard jobs. And, you know, through my career, I, been a squad leader, platoon sergeant, first sergeant, drill sergeant, and, and I was a first sergeant, and the first sergeant of a headquarters battery, which, it, which was really, really tough. Um, it, it was a lot tougher than I ever thought, but I think being in those positions and working with all the great soldiers I had through the years, um, I got promoted on, you know, with with all of that behind me. Well, let me tell you, making, uh, getting to the top of your game in any, um, 
in any endeavor is impressive and being a command sergeant major in the army is a big deal and thank you so much for your leadership uh, oh, that is thank you. that is huge you know tell me do you remember some of your soldiers is there any soldiers you're really proud of is there somebody that you can point to and say yeah i i helped that person somehow uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are still guys that, that I stay in touch with uh, from, from Germany. I remember, uh, I remember I was out with, uh, and this was as a sergeant major, uh, my battalion commander was uh, Heidi Brown, who is, uh, I think, retired a two-star, maybe a three-star by now, but um, we were out at uh at bliss and out on a range and they were doing this this crazy thing they did with a with the headquarters or with a, the patriot units where they had to react to an ambush and um what it basically consisted of was you you took a battery and the guys would get into firing positions in the prone and they would fire at these targets and you hit this target and they would count up the number of hits and that would consider whether you were qualified in that reaction drill. And I, you know, I saw that and I thought, well, oh, wait a minute, why, why would a, why would a Patriot battery be rolling around somewhere and run into an ambush? Uh, because I thought, you know, these freaking trucks are so damn big. Where, where are you going to be where you're going to be subjected to an ambush by infantry anywhere? Well, you know, who would have thought that we were going to be doing that in, in Iraq and Afghanistan? But anyway, uh, we were doing that. And I had this, this uh, little female troop named Suva who was getting ready to go on the line. And she was a little nervous. And... Uh, the first sergeant was explaining what was going to happen. And he says, Sergeant Major, you want to go out there and shoot some rounds? And I said, hell yeah. And my Colonel, but uh, Colonel Brown looked at me like, Sergeant Major, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to go shoot some rounds, man. And I looked at Suva. I said, Suva, you have a battle buddy here? And she said, well, no. And I said, well, I'm your battle buddy. And I grabbed someone's M16. I grabbed about four or five magazines. And Suva and I went down there and we just started firing down range. And, you know, we did the drill where I'll fire you move. And, you know, she was, she was eating it up. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of cool, but, you know, I, I had, I had my time with my female troops uh, and even, even the, the young male guys, it was, it was really eye opening for me because that was the first time I've really been exposed to female troops uh, and I learned, I had a couple of female troops one time tell me, you got to treat us just like the guys. You can't cut us any slack. And uh, at that point, you know, I realized I was talking to my, my battery commander, Brian Dysinger, and, and I told him what, what, this, what this female soldier told me. And, and uh, I said, I'm, I'm going to start treating them just like guys. And he goes, what are you talking about? He goes, I'm going to just treat them as good or as bad as I do my, my male, my male troops. And, uh, that kind of like turned the tide for me. And I think my female soldiers, when they saw me not cutting them any slack, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I had the reputation of, of being a real stern, you know, uh, Sergeant Major, you know, airborne drill sergeant. Yeah, but I, I like to cut up with the guys too. But I, I would, uh, I would, I would cut up with them. But I would also drop them for push-ups in a heartbeat. So I, I think um, that kind of gave me a new perspective in how to deal with soldiers, which, um, which I think I enjoyed, and I think they enjoyed me doing. I mean, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. Tell me, tell me about, uh, about who you pray for at night and who prays for you, you know, who, who are your loved ones that, that take care of you and, and that, that you love so much? Uh, well, I mean, my wife, uh, Cece, uh, she and I got married in 93 when I was a first sergeant 
And uh, we met just before Desert Storm, uh, or Desert Shield, I should say. We met it in Fayetteville. And she, before we got married, uh, she always looked out for me because she's a, a speech therapist and worked at a hospital, uh, at, at, worked at Cape Fear, uh, dealing with patients that had traumatic brain injuries. And it was no coincidence, you know, that I was a paratrooper and we would occasionally have guys get concussions. Uh, so when I would come back from a jump, you know, I get cleaned up and I come into bed, she would wake me up at night. And, you know, after a jump, particularly, she'd wake me up and said, are you okay? And I said, yes, I'm fine. Why are you waking me up? And she said, I want to make sure you're not, you're not in a coma because you had a concussion and that you're able to wake up. So, you know, she was always looking out for me. And, you know, I, 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 you know, being in the army, you take things for granted, uh, especially if you're overseas, you're going on deployments. And I don't give my wife enough credit for taking care of our household and taking care of me when I've been deployed or on exercises or even now as a civilian, you know, doing the crazy stuff I do. You know, she's always looking out for me. So I'm glad, I'm glad she's doing that. Amen. 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 They say there's no atheist in foxholes. Tell me a little bit about your spirituality. Was there some something that kept you going, you know, on those long road marches or, uh, you know, when you kind of started counting to 4,000 when you went out the door or anything like that? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of hard to pin down as far as spirituality because I, I got raised a Catholic uh, Ro a Roman Catholic kid, you know, I was an altar boy. And, and, you know, like I mentioned before, I went to a Catholic grade school in high school. Um, my mom was very religious and, you know, we would walk to church every Sunday. Um, but I also, I, I guess in my mind and, and the Carlos version of Christianity expect a lot more from the church and the Vatican, uh, and realize, I mean, my version of my spirituality is be a good person, um, treat people respectfully, uh, don't be an asshole, but I also don't expect a lot from God. Uh, and what I mean by that is I'm not looking for any special favors. I don't, I don't pray to win the lottery. Uh, I, I haven't prayed for anyone to be healed when they're sick, because in my mind, in my version of this religion, I think God gives us free will, and he just asks that we be good and don't kill anybody, you know, keep those Ten Commandments, but uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff that, that happens in the world. And there are a lot of people that ask, and a lot of atheists probably ask, well, if there's a God, why does he let that stuff happen? And I said, well, I, I think, you know, in my version, we can be petty. And uh, for me to ask to win the lottery or for me to ask that I get cured from cancer, there are bigger issues in the world. And I think God is, my version of God is going to let me live my life and Whatever I do, however, if I decide to go left instead of right, um, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my life is going to happen. So I took a very, uh, what, I, what I call a fatalistic approach to jumping out of airplanes and going into combat and everything else in life because I've seen some really crazy stuff happened to good people that took a lot of precautions but still died. Uh, I was on that jump with Clements and I think his name was McHugh, uh, who died on the jump that I was on uh, in Bravo Battery. And, you know, McHugh's, that was his first jump with the battery. Clements, you know, he was, you know, a good guy. 
that was his airborne buddy and you know they passed away um could that have been prevented well yeah i mean what, what would have taken just one second delay between clements or McHugh of separation in the door um would it would it have been 30 seconds before takeoff that we stayed on the runway you know what what could have happened to prevent that from happening you you go crazy thinking about all of that so i realized that you know you i can't really you turn yourself crazy trying to prevent um a disaster like that so you rely on your training you trust the guys in front of you or behind you or are trained as well as you are and you, man, man, you could just go do your shit, go do your shit. And whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, um, we're back. So, so tell me about that day. Tell me about, about that jump where two of your, you know, teammates passed away. Ah, uh, well, you know, it was like any other jump. Um, everything, everything was fine. Uh, I there wasn't anything really out of the ordinary with that jump that I remember. Uh, it was a day daylight jump. I think we were the only C one thirty. It could have been a, a well one forty one. I don't remember, um, but. You know, I I think what happened was that those guys got tangled up uh, and I don't think they're when they're when their shoots deployed, I think they just got wrapped up around each other and, you know, they they just fell, uh, didn't have a chance to activate the reserves. And, you know, they passed out, they passed away on the drop zone. Um, It it really. Uh caught everybody by surprise in the battery because, you know, like I said, we normalized what we do in that it's a very dangerous uh, endeavor. And um, we, you know, it kind of made everybody, you know, just step back a little bit and realize that, man, uh, yeah, this this is really dangerous what we do. Um, but there was, I, you know, as a, I, I believe I was a platoon sergeant at the time. Uh, and, and I wasn't involved as a jump master. Or I wasn't on the jump master team. I was just a jumper with everybody else. Uh, I, I know that there was an investigation done. I don't think they found anything really out of the ordinary that, that happened. Uh, it's just a case of, you know, uh, a new, a jumper, a new jumper is, you know, six jump, you know, right out of jump school with the unit and his jump buddy just got tangled up. Uh, so, yeah, but I mean, it, dash ones or T10s. Oh man. Uh, I don't know. Will. to be honest with you, I mean, if I went back and I, you know, I, I had my jump log, I could go back and find out, but I, I don't remember. I think I want to say they were T10s. Really? Yeah. Because I mean, even for a while there, I remember when the MC1-1 B and C started coming out with us and we used them. But after a while, it seemed like all we started jumping were T10s. Um, And mainly because I think we just had a lot of guys that just couldn't control those those steerable shoots. And especially, you know, when when you're in a mass tech or something, you know, you, you had another layer of of uh, something that could get you in trouble. You know, you're, you, you got guys that just couldn't steer and, you know, they would run with the wind instead of, you know, turning into the wind and running into each other. So I think at some point division said, yeah, let, let's cut back on those, on those dash ones and just start jumping T10s. So I, I, so this was the accident with the death was just a few years before I got there. Uh, but 
I remember people telling me that it was a dash one accident and that that was one of the reasons that they stopped doing dash ones and T10 mixes. Apparently, yeah. apparently somebody, or this was at a time when you could literally draw parachutes and the guy next to you could have a T10 and you could have a dash one. Oh, all right. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I wasn't there. I was hoping you'd help clarify that, but but I was told that that accident is part of what started the ADEPT option one and ADEPT option two that we started and implemented in the ASOP about how we would alternate door for exit instead of putting okay. everybody out mass tack. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I don't, I didn't realize that you could mix T10s and dash ones in a plane load and have those two versions of shoots. I thought it was one or the other. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and, and you talk about the alternating exit, you know, that sounds like, yeah, we're going to do that. But you know how it is on an airplane, you know, when, when you're over a drop zone at night and you're trying to get out and you don't want to make that second pass, uh, that jump master can try to control who's going out, but shit, guys are going out anyway. So oh, it's great. Great times, man. Great times. Tell me about, you know, tell me about how your career ended and stuff. What, how did you decide to get out and, and all that stuff? Well, um, a couple of several, there were about three different things that, that happened that influenced my getting out. Um, I was a battalion, uh, command sergeant major, uh, at, at Fort bliss and, I, I wasn't really digging on Fort Bliss being in a force comm unit. Um, I, I had been a Patriot uh, in Patriot units for about four years now. And when you grew up in units like, in divisional units like the 82nd, and you get thrust into a Patriot unit, uh, that the ethos and the mentality is a lot different than you're used to dealing with. And that was, you know, in, in my case, did you, did you ever serve in the Patriot Battalion? I think you did. Yeah. Uh, you know, we didn't get, at least in my case, I didn't have any kind of transition, much less training to prepare me for that transition, which was pretty, you know, a pretty hard transition. I mean, um, the mentality of the two types of soldiers were very drastic, uh, as well as the officers, because in, in third of the fourth, you know, you talk about the great officers that we had and the platoon leaders that we had, we had some great leaders, but they were leaders. You know, they were out there with you in everything. Well, in Patriot, it's not the case. Those lieutenants are in the van training how to shoot down those ballistic targets. Uh, we really didn't have platoon leaders that were out there with the troops, which I had a really hard time wrapping my head around. Uh, the, le the leadership aspect between the two organizations was difficult for me to um, to wrap my head around. So, uh, I, I had a hard time trying to figure out, is it me that needs to change in my leadership style or do I need to change everybody else to do what I think soldiers need to be doing? Uh, I think I did the latter. And if I had the only Patriot battalion on four bliss, I probably could have succeeded, but Fort Bliss is not the environment for, for you to take on something like that when there are so many other Patriot uh, units around and the attitude um, and the leadership is structured around that. So I had a real tough time dealing with that kind of atmosphere. Uh, and because I had that 
that mentality of a divisional soldier, I was a little bit too blunt with um, some of the leadership on Fort Bliss. I've always was one to speak my mind. You know, I, like I mentioned how smart a mouth I had as a kid. Uh, I got a little more tactful as a Sergeant Major, but there were just things that I felt I needed to say. And there was a lot, there were a lot of people that didn't appreciate me saying that uh, in that kind of environment. Uh, I had also finished my degree. Uh, I got a Bachelor of Science degree from Park College. And I really started thinking hard about where am I going with my life? Because I was in my 40s and I was kind of at a point where I was early in my career when I had six years in the army, you know, you, you got to decide, am I going to stay in or am I going to get out? And I was at the point of my career as a Sergeant Major with, am I going to stay for 35 or do I want to get out a job uh, and make a living or am I going to rely on an army retirement? Um, and I chose the latter. Uh, I talked to my wife and uh, she, you know, she's a speech therapist. She worked a long time to, to get that career going. And she was very good at what she did, but she followed me to Germany for three years and didn't work. And then the, the almost four years we were at Fort Bliss, uh, she didn't, she wasn't working as a speech pathologist either. So I really owed it to her to not drag her around the world with me. And, you know, in, in 2000, uh, we moved seven times in five years. Wow. And uh, we decided, yeah, I, I think my fund meter's pegged out and uh, it's time for us to retire. And we decided we were gonna get out. Um, now, do I regret that? I, I think that probably would be the question you want to ask. Did I regret getting out? Uh, I Had I stayed in a divisional unit instead of going to a Patriot unit, and if I'd have stayed in, a, in an area or if I'd have stayed on Fort Bragg or Fort Campbell, um, who knows? I, I may have still stayed in the Army because, I mean, I, I loved being a soldier um but who, but who knows i mean like i said things happen for a reason uh when i had my chance to either go to the left or go to the right i took the road that led me to go to patriot and that's where i'm at so um i i, I can't say that i left with really a bad attitude um but I was ready to move on to a different chapter of my life. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you were going to like, uh, you know, like, there's some people that are patriots that right wave flags or some people that are quiet. Uh, tell me about your, your patriotism and how, how you show, you know, show things. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've never been anyone that's been very showy. I, I don't, I've never been one to draw attention to myself. Uh, so I've never been, and I've never been the kind of person, I mean, even when I was in the military, you know, to wave the flag and, and I'm not jumping out in front of a crowd, you know, Pledge of Allegiance or singing the Star Spangled Banner. I, I, I kind of like to stay in the background, uh, but yeah, I mean, I love my country and uh, I don't think you can serve in the military for 24 years whether you were airborne or not, uh, you can't be in the military for that long without loving your country right. and, being, and being patriotic. Uh, does that mean that I agree with everything that all the presidents have done through my life? Oh, hell no. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I wouldn't support you. I wouldn't fight for you if it came down to it or any of the other guys that I ever served with. Uh, that doesn't mean that if I got called up and that I wouldn't fight. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a secret how I felt about Trump uh, as president. Um, 
Uh, I'm not real crazy about some of the things that Biden has done either, but I mean, that's neither here nor there, but yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not a very, you know, I, I don't have a lot of bumper stickers on my, on my vehicle professing my patriotism. I, I have two stickers, an 82nd patch and my master wings. Amen. That's, that's like, that's like what I would have too. That's what I've got. I've yeah. got a metal one and I got master wings. That's cool, right? That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that tells everybody, I mean, you, you, you don't get master wings for staying, for being in the army for three years. Uh, if, and I don't, I don't have anything on there that says I was a command sergeant major. I don't have a bunch of ribbons on. I don't have anything. I was in Desert Storm. Uh, but I, I think if if you know me, then you know me, and you know how I am. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not a very re overly religious person either. Uh, I, I, you know, I never dropped down to my knee in front of a crowd to say a prayer when I got promoted. Uh, I, I never, um, I, I just think that there are some things that are better left privately to do. And those are kind of the things that I do, whether it's patriotism or my spirituality or even, you know, showing affection with my loved ones. I, Amen. Yeah, so. Amen. And so as we as we head towards closing out of here, you know, I've been asking folks to uh, call their unit to attention and then say, you know, uh, like, like, you know, you'd, you'd say signing out, you know, like, uh, you know, so Major Martinez signing out or something like that. And I think that would be cool. Uh, so just put that in your head. You know, at some point I want to I want to do that. Do you have a do you have a story, you know, you haven't told, you know, that that maybe. Maybe I don't know that you you you, you, you comes to mind. Uh, well, I mean, there are a lot of stories. Uh, there there are a couple. Uh, on your when you sent out your questions, you know, you asked about uh, whether or not I ever used my weapon, and and I guess that was in combat, um, and I I didn't. Uh, when when I was in Desert Storm. Uh, Bravo Battery had the mission to protect Abcake uh, in Saudi Arabia. So we weren't in Champion, Maine. We were out in the desert uh, protecting this oil refinery in Abcake. But um, one day uh, we were training and the uh, Hilton, uh, Pascal Hilton was our first sergeant. Uh, and he, we were called upon to practice uh, airborne operations and actions in the aircraft. So, you know, you're, you're, you're in desert shield still, and you get called on to pra practice actions in the aircraft. Well, that starts running through your brain, and we're thinking like, holy shit, where are we jumping into? You know, are, are we going to jump into combat, or are we just going to jump to for jump pay uh but anyway uh we so all of us were, were together in our little compound and there was an explosion and i remember that uh uh i don't know if you remember uh, robert delgado uh, or delgado the hhb uh, ranger uh he was a 24 mike but he was with us uh, there were a couple of other platoon sergeants in Bravo Battery, but we were all sitting around eating MREs and we left our weapons outside of this tent and we were just eating our MREs and we heard this explosion. And I remember we kind of all looked at each other for about a second. It seems like it was about minutes, but it was a second and we looked at each other and without anybody saying anything, we all ran out to grab our weapons got our weapons, we locked and loaded, and we thought, this is it. The Iraqis have run the border. They're, there's a push into Abcake to take this oil refinery. And all of us got into a perimeter around this tent. We locked and loaded, <clears throat> and we were ready for whatever was going to happen. And uh, eventually, somebody came by and said, 
cease fire, unload your weapons, there was an explosion. It's not, you know, enemy action. And what had happened was uh, a, a young troop with the infantry that we were in this compound with had been out in the desert on the range and he picked up a dud 66 millimeter rocket from a, from a law. And for whatever the reason, it didn't go off when this law got fired. He brought the rocket back and had it in his rucksack. Uh, and the first sergeant and the commander for the HHC had a TA-50 layout. And this guy had this rocket and he shoved it under his, under his cot. The first sergeant and commander go through this guy's tent to look at their TA-50 and walk out. He goes to put the rocket back in his rucksack. And I guess all of the jostling, jostling around was enough to detonate this rocket. And it detonated. And that was the explosion we heard. Uh, the first sergeant, who, who I knew, because I was his Vulcan or his air defense platoon sergeant, uh, it shook him up pretty hard. And uh, I mean, he, he really was bothered by the fact that he literally had walked past this guy's cot uh, and that rocket could have just very easily exploded when he was in there. But that set a lot of stuff in motion. But, you know, that, that goes back to talking about, you know, the precautions you can take and what can happen to you that you have no control over. Uh, so that, that was, a, uh, yeah, that was a, a, a story that, that always, I always tell people because it, there were a lot of things in motion, but, you know, we were just sitting around, you know, smoking a joke and eating MREs and boom, something like that happens and you flip that switch, man, and it's go time. And, um, yeah. Oh, it's crazy times back then, right? You, yeah. You're on edge every moment when you're deployed like that. You never know, know what's going to happen. You got live rounds. You got, I mean, hey, I remember when, when Desert Shield and Desert Storm happened. I'm going to tell you, so, there was a lot of folks that was worried about getting shot in the back in third of the fourth. Oh, oh is that right? <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You heard those stories. It's crazy. There was, there was some folks over there say, I didn't deploy with the battalion. I was in Korea. But, you know, I heard stories on the other side about how they took people's, you know, weapons away and stuff, and they were afraid they were going to shoot. I think Locklear, I think Top Locklear was worried about getting shot. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I, I, I could tell you stories about Locklear. Maybe, maybe not here, but um, he and I went around uh, several times back when I was an acting first sergeant uh, because of some shenanigans he pulled, but Oh, wow. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it's interesting all the relationships and stories and stuff that, that you know, are back those times, especially when you're deployed and so much testosterone in us all back then, right? You're, yeah. you're we're rocking and rolling with testosterone, deployed guns, you know, gunpowder. We're ready to, we're ready to kill something, man. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, it was funny that, you know, we had, unlike the rest of the battalion, Bravo Battery had, an actual objective that we were guarding. We had Balkans uh, around Abcake, but we also, there was an air base uh, that the 82nd uh, Aviation uh, Brigade was stationed at where all, the, all of the uh, helicopter assets were. Well, I had a Balkan platoon that was guarding that installation too. So between Abcake uh, and then my platoon at Al Hafouf, I think it was, uh, you know, we were out there in the desert, you know, living in holes with the rest of the battalion at Champion, Maine. And it was, it, it was, I mean, we were cool about it too, because, you know, bro, you know, you, you know, when you got everybody together, like, yeah, bravo, we're the only ones that had a real mission. You know, we're, we're guarding installation. You guys are in the back, you know, in the rear with the gear. But the thing that used to happen that would drive me crazy was, um, uh, Colonel Kirk uh, used to have these battalion organizational days where he'd get everybody together 
and he wanted to establish some camaraderie and have some fun and he would you know have cookouts and you know have all these things for everybody to do which was great when you were on champion maine but we were like two hours away so when he would do that stuff we'd have to load on these freaking uh, Saudi buses at four in the morning from Abcake and take that two hour bus ride to Champion, Maine for Italian fun day. And we were like, so pissed off. Like, God, I just, I just want to go back to go, go back to bed. So who were those guys back then? I'm thinking of McDade and Railton and Wold. Who else was some names from back then, man? What well, were uh, you in? Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you another story. Uh, Railton, Railton was my platoon leader's driver during Desert Storm. Uh, Tori Worley uh, was my platoon leader. And I had, my driver was a kid by the name of Downey. Uh, Downey and Railton were good guys, but Railton, I mean, he was a wild guy even back then, but, but good, he was a good guy. Uh, but so here's my story. Um, we were deploying, getting ready to deploy back after Desert, Desert Storm. So we were on this long convoy back to, uh, I, I guess, a holding area where we were going to start marshalling vehicles and getting everything ready to ship back to the States. Well, it's at night and we got this massive convoy of hundreds of vehicles with the infantry task force that we're with and Downey and I are, are driving and my vehicle craps out. It overheats. I got to pull over to the side of the road and we pop the top of this Humvee and I, there's a little rubber hose, probably two inches long that blew and we're stuck. We can't go anywhere. Convoy is long gone. It's at night and we're in freaking Iraq, not a soul to be seen. And me and Downey are like, man, what the fuck are we gonna do? I try to get on the radio to everybody, but I, I can't reach anyone. And we see this old dilapidated truck that some Saudi has pulled over on the side of the road. And we go over to it and we basically cut up a radiator hose to put in our vehicle. But dude, it has been like two hours since we fell out of this convoy. And, you know, you talk about luck. Uh, Downey and I got everything back together. We got the vehicle going and we're racing down this freaking road, 60 miles an hour in a Humvee and a trailer. And it must have been an hour of not seeing anything. And I'm praying, oh my God, please don't let me get lost out here because who's going to find me? Uh, and after about an hour, a little more than an hour, we finally see taillights. And at this point, I don't give a shit who it is. I'm going to follow whoever is in this convoy. And we, we, we catch the convoy and I eventually drive up and I find my place in line and I get in there, but man, you know, you talk about, uh, pucker factor and, 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 and doing some praying because, you know, who wants to get lost out in the desert and, you know, or get rolled up on by some crazy Iraqis that haven't surrendered yet. Um, but yeah, good times. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, time. Downey and Railton, uh, those were those were my two my two guys that you know I spent a lot of time with because my uh, as a platoon sergeant, everybody else is, is they've got weapons and Balkans deployed, and these are our two drivers. So I'm with those guys for months out in the desert. Oh yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, Railton. Railton was in a squad with me at one to one point before I left uh, and went to Korea in 1990, right before you got back, I guess. So yeah, great yeah. times, but great times. So let's close this thing out. Call uh, call your unit to attention, and then and then sign out for me, and and uh, and we'll close this thing out, dude. It's been an honor, man. Thank you so much for spending oh. time with me. It's it's really cool. It's really cool. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, 
you know, I, I, I didn't actually, I always wondered, why does he want to talk to me? Uh, you know, I, I think everybody in the Army, especially if you've been in it a long time, you hope that you made a mark or left of mark or made an impression with somebody that uh, you've done some good. And, you know, I, I enjoyed my time. Uh, I don't know that I, I, at least in my mind, don't know that I was, you know, the epitome of, of, a, of a soldier. I, I think we all try to do our best. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I said, man, Will doesn't want to talk to me. I mean, I was just some Rudy Poot, Rudy Poot first sergeant and sergeant major out there. But oh no, that's I, that's, I, that's I, not true at all. It's not true at all. And and I have to tell so many people, they're like, I'm not a hero, but I get it. Here's the thing: when the alarm clock went off for 24 years, you got your lazy ass out of bed and you went and did what you're supposed to do, right? And that's yeah. that's a hero, right? That's a yeah. hero. Yeah, I, I think I think that if if you were in third or the fourth. Uh, and you just did the normal expected duty of, of a paratrooper, we were all heroes because, like I said, we've normalized something that was a very, very dangerous proposition. And it's going on right now. I mean, even in the Army. I, I used to tell the civilians that I worked with that there are, we, we did a lot of dangerous stuff that people don't realize. And I mean, the Navy just lost some guys on a training exercise where, where a helicopter crashed in San Diego. Uh, you know, stuff like that happens all the time. Tanks get flipped, vehicles run into, run into rivers. Uh, you know, we are in a very dangerous profession, but we are just, oblivious to the danger that we are in sometimes and you know I, I think in that respect yeah we're all heroes so um um I, i'll sign off with uh, the call sign that one of my uh some of the guys in my patriot unit gave me they used to call me the jackal and i don't know if you remember but back in the 70s there was a there was a terrorist that, uh, hang on a second. My, my cat of all things is trying to get into the room. <laughs> all right, come on, Dander. But, so, uh, there was a terrorist called Carlos the Jackal. Yeah. And, and uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, when I was at Fort Bliss, one of my Patriot platoon sergeants, uh, we were out at the NCO club and he, he inadvertently called me Jackal. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he goes, oh shit, sorry, Major. Sorry, but that's what we call you behind your back. And I said, Jackal? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. So that was kind of like my unofficial call sign. So- I love it, I love it, yeah. yay. So, all right, uh, so, all, to all you troops, uh, you got Jackal, Carlos Jackal Martinez saying, good luck, uh, happy landings, and I'll see you on the high point. Amen. Thank you, Sergeant Major. I appreciate it, buddy. Hey, well, appreciate you, man. Uh, and, and thanks for doing this for everybody, for us sharing our memories and you, you know, recording everything and putting it out there for posterity. Um, I, I'm glad you're doing this for everybody. Thank oh, you. thanks. You're thanks. my hero. You're my oh, hero. Thank you. Hey, do me a favor. I haven't had anybody do this. Do this. Tell to say everybody like and subscribe, Marshall in the Middle. Yeah. So, Marshall in the Middle, hey, this is a great program. This is something that is getting our memories out there for everybody to see, whether you're a relative, whether you're a friend or an associate. Check in a Marshall in the Middle and find out what your friends have done in the military because everybody is a hero and everybody needs to hear the stories that these heroes have done. Oh my gosh, I love it, Sergeant Major. Thank you. You're well, have a good night, man. Thank you. You too, buddy.